bit about a special relationship that Naughty Dog has had with a Legorhythmic. Uh, we've been developing our pipeline alongside their software for the last four years, and we're thrilled, just as we're about to release Uncharted 4, to be able to share a lot of our tips and tricks and our journey of really integrating Substance Designer into our pipeline completely with you all here. So for all you early birds, here's a special treat. We've got the Uncharted 4 story trailer. I hope you enjoy. How's the audio on that? Gets me every time still, I swear. So as I said, at Naughty Dog, Substance Designer became a really integral part of our texturing workflow, internally and externally. And you know, my role during that development process was to mainly build a library of tools that artists can use. And you can see here, we've got a custom library of all kinds of different nodes. So we've got some basic height map libraries and mask libraries. We've got some compositing and blend functions, as well as a lot of normal AO and various other things I'm going to go into later. So the adoption of this pipeline was really important for us for a number of reasons. Um, we, we really needed a streamlined production, right? But we needed to be as creative and open as possible. So it was important that a lot of these tools are really emulating traditional workflows and artistic principles. So I'm going to start by actually just creating a new substance to demonstrate some simple ones for you here. And you'll notice I've set up a custom template. And this is really flexible here because I can go to our Naughty Dog default and you see there's a number of different texture types that we can export straight into our pipeline right away. Let's just call this GDC test. And you'll see now what I'm presented with is a lot of nodes ready to go so artists can just jump right in and work. And if I reset the scene here and throw this in the viewport, you'll see it's the beginning of a very, very, very simple texture. It's just a wavy height map and then all the different texture outputs are being generated off of that. And I'm going to go into more detail about these later. But the, the really cool thing about this is all of the presets are ready to go. So all the naming conventions, it's hooked up to our customized shader. 
Uh, so we were able to customize a lot of this initial workflow so you can just jump right in and start working. So over here on the slide deck, as we start looking through some of these library assets in our workflow, we're going to cover some universal tips. So just a couple quick things to keep in mind. If you're ready to start building your own library and your own workflow, and we're going to take a look at some examples of tiling textures. And then we're going to look at, at some examples of how we used some of these nodes in the context of props. Uh, so you see here, actually, up in this package, I've actually got a game, a very, very simple game asset here, uh, with a number of different textures up here. So we use Substance Designer heavily for props. So one thing to keep in mind when you're, when you're starting a procedural material is for us, all of our workflow and all of our tools, they all come back to principles, right? So Uncharted is a very stylized game. So it's important that you know, when you're thinking about a height map or generating a procedural height map, you're thinking about sculpting. And when you're thinking about albedo maps, you're actually just thinking about painting. So it was important for a lot of our tools to reflect those principles. So you see here this very simple example. And oftentimes, this is how my, this is how my material workflow starts, actually. And if I, I apologize, I didn't have time to frame up these graphs, but I'll give you a run through of how it's organized right now. So the idea here, so the idea here is that I'm starting with very, very simple modules, right? So here is, is an example of a, of a stone generator that's going to generate, you know, four random stones for me. And there's a few customization controls here that are built in. And if we actually just, you know what, let's do this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to plug this guy directly into, into my, the final point in my graph. So I'm just sending him straight uh, into the normal generation. And, and that's another important point. So when I'm working, I, I try to do everything in the height map first, right? So all I'm doing at this early stage is I'm evaluating form. Because I, I won't bother doing a color map or anything else until I know that the forms are working. So I, I push everything through one auto levels at the very end. And then I generate all my normals off of that. So I can control that strength. And then we also have a custom ambient occlusion generator that I'll, I'll go into briefly. And then from there, there's two other maps I always generate. So there's, there's going to be the hard-edged cavity, but then also a soft curvature. And I'll, I'll show you some examples there later. So right away, this is kind of, you know, just in a matter of minutes, you know, I can pop in my, my new template file, and I can start working in this way and bring in my height maps. So if we actually replace this node now, let's auto-level that. You can see that there's a, there's a couple other things happening here, right? So, and the reason why I've got four rocks in here is really just for efficiency. And that's another really important point, right? So when I'm, when I'm designing all of these nodes, there's three, there's three things that I'm always keeping in mind, right? So as I start demonstrating some of these, you'll see I want to be very explicit. So I, I don't want to just have magic recipes of two nodes that come together and do something, but you aren't quite sure why. I, you know, I want you to be able to grab a node, and just by how it's named, you, you know what you're going to get from it. And then the key is very, very modular, right? But also lightweight. So these should be very efficient to keep the workflow really smooth. And so here you see I'm just splitting them out, and then I'm instancing them. And by that, we have a few pattern makers, right? So the instancer is essentially just a node uh, that runs an effects map. And if you aren't familiar with effects maps, there's some great demonstrations. I, I won't have time to get into the details of them today. But essentially, 
uh, sorry, on the Allegorithmic website and their YouTube channel. You'll be able to find more information on them there. But essentially, this is where the real power came in into our pipeline nodes, right? So this is where you can really start customizing how these shapes are drawn onto your canvas. So essentially what's happening is, you know, these are some basic functions that just describe, you know, how this pattern is drawn. And so here's just a, a basic function that, that just describes the, the transformation of each of these shapes. So, you know, if you're looking into getting into some advanced usage, effects maps are definitely, definitely a way to go and really started opening up a lot of possibilities for us. So here you can see, you know, in this node, I can just start changing the scale of these primary forms, right? And at this point, I know I need a rock face, but I don't quite know, you know, what exactly it's going to look like. So, you know, I know I want very angular cut forms, so I've set this guy up to work this way. Otherwise, maybe I could round them out and then just soften out all these forms a little bit. That's a bit too much. <laughs> But the idea is that it's all very, very flexible and non-destructive. So at any point, I can go in and, and swap these nodes out and change my graph. And then of course there's, there's various rotation controls, and I can reiterate that. I should show you that guy. And you can start generating all kinds of interesting shapes. So here's another very, very simple example. And this represents just about maybe 10, 15 minutes of work where, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm describing just the basic shapes here and then I'm sending them in through the instancer to layer them up. And I've got my primary forms pretty well established. And then as we move up the chain, you'll see that there's, there's this node here, which is, which is called the form builder, right? And so what he does, and if I, if I increase the blend amount a little bit, so you're gonna see that there's, there's two forms interacting here, right? So if I, if I bring my foreground opacity down, then you'll see that I'm, I'm mainly just looking at my primary forms. So now I wanna add more detail, and I wanna bring in the secondary forms a little bit. And I'm going to over crank it here for demonstration purposes. And you can see that there's a few things happening. So inside this node, I've got a number of things built in where I can start warping each of these layers by the other one, right? So where a normal blend node might give you results like this, where the two forms aren't necessarily, you know, very well integrated, uh, this is going to integrate them a lot more naturally so that now they're affecting each other and it looks a little bit more organic. I'm going to drop the resolution of the graph a bit just to speed up the demonstration. And then as we move further up the chain, you see I'm essentially just repeating that exact same process. So again, I'm using the same node. In fact, this node right here is used in almost all the textures that I'm going to demonstrate. Because the key takeaway is that I'm always taking these, these very almost procedural looking textures that by themselves uh, actually maybe aren't great in isolation. And you see this one here is, is actually very, very procedural in nature. Uh, but when you combine it with this node in interesting ways, it actually, you can start to get more organic results. So the apparent procedural nature of them are kind of hidden. How's the feedback? Is the feedback okay? So I talked a little bit about the effects maps and how important they are for drawing some of these shapes out onto the canvas, right? But there's some other fun ones here. So 
when you're looking to start getting into some advanced usage, the Pixel processor on the, on the right-hand side here is another really, really flexible and powerful node. So if we take a look at this guy, right, and I'll show you an example later on of, of this as well. It's, it's an extremely simple, let's close that. So it's an extremely simple node that's basically going to perform a function on every pixel on the texture, right? So in this case, it's just a simple, you know, floating point color. But then you can, you can go in and you've got a lot of other math operators as well. So you can start, you know, really getting a lot of customization inside this node and it's very, very fast. So with stuff like that in mind, we're able to start doing some pretty interesting things. So here I've got this kind of, in fact, actually, let me use a better texture. Let's actually use the final result here. So what's cool about this color scheme generator, right, is, is it works on RGB primaries, right? So you're probably used to in color mixing, working with red, yellow, and blue primaries, and you're trying to get analogous color palettes, um, just so that all your, or other color palettes, just so that your colors all work together in harmony. Right, so that's, that's really important as a texture artist. So we decided to build it into the software for us. So in this case, I can just pick you know, a certain color. And in this case, it's just generating the complementary color for me. Now I can certainly pick a different palette and I can have an analogous palette now. And I can change the spread on that. So maybe these are the three colors I, I wanna run with. So now I can actually just, in my texturing process, I can just go ahead and you know, pick from my, my palette. And oftentimes, this might be how I start a texture when I'm trying to just find a harmonious color palette. So it's, there's a lot of things that we're able to just build right into the software so you don't even have to leave the software, which makes for a much better experience. The really cool thing about this guy is actually you can also sample the input texture. So actually if I increase that spread to uh, exaggerate it, you see I've got three variations on there. So this is similar to like hue variations or something that you might find in another application. So now I, I'm outputting all three of them and I can maybe blend them together in other interesting ways. So, as I've been going through some of these graphs, uh, you'll notice that, and I already touched on this a little bit, but you'll notice that the flow of these graphs is very, very simple. And that, you know, I've demonstrated how I'm starting to build up forms vertically. So each of these layers represents a level of detail, right? So from large primary forms, you know, smaller secondary forms, and then surface details all the way up. And as we move vertically through the graph, uh, you're basically just treating those almost as layers on your texture, right? And this kind of universal language made it really easy to create a lot of library nodes. Artists were working in similar fashions, and we could share these things and right away jump in and uh, understand each other's networks. Because one of the key takeaways is that, you know, it, it's a procedural tool it's node-based, and for a while it was intimidating for our artists, right? Um, but working in a common layout and language and then having tools that reflected artistic principles really made the transition much more natural and uh, ultimately you know, increased the adoption rate. So, and I've already touched on the familiarity right there. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. Um, but let's take a look at this guy. So the example that I just showed you, that's kind of how my process starts, right? I'm just playing with forms, and I'm building them together. And now I'm... This one, let's, I think this guy's a good one. Again, I'm gonna drop the resolution slightly here, just to 
speed up the playback. There we go. There we go. So you see the common layout again, right? And as we evaluate the thought process behind here, in fact, <laughs> I told you before, and this is an important point, keep your trash, right? This little rock here is probably terrible if I were to use it in any other circumstance, right? And even this little splatter I did here by itself actually isn't all that interesting, right? But the secret is really in just how you start blending all of these things together, right? So again, another very simple low frequency form, blend it up, and as we move all the way up our stack, you can see I'm getting more and more detail until I actually get something that is, is you know, representative of what I'm after. So it's a very, very flexible workflow in that you know, at any time I can decide, well, I either want to completely remove a layer or I want to bring in another one entirely and change that, and change that result, right? So it makes for a very, very flexible workflow. And many times I've revisited my graphs in production and changed them a number of times. I think I just broke the, well, there we go. So you'll also notice that this graph here that I just opened looks nearly identical to the one that I just opened previously. It's actually a duplicate of that same graph. Actually, all of these are duplicates of this graph. So if I want to keep experimenting but save my results, usually what I do is I just copy and paste that back into the package, and then I'll rename it, and now I can experiment and then completely change my results again. So within a matter of an hour, I might have half a dozen or a dozen of these different rock variations, and then I just pick from my favorite ones. So after the forms are well established, I'm ready to really start like nailing down some basic color paths, right? And there's a few tricks I like to do to do that. You'll notice that, you know, here, and actually now might be a good time actually to show you the custom ambient occlusion node. This guy's kind of fun. So there's a few tricks here with this guy. If I reset him back to default, and, and again, this is the beautiful part about Substance Designer, right? We're, we're building all of our own tools. In fact, actually, if I open him up and show you, so <laughs> by himself, he actually doesn't look that complicated, right? But when I set the library up, you'll notice that down here, there's a technical tool shelf so that, you know, these little pieces and parts are actually modules themselves. So at every step of the way, I've got a bunch of little simple reusable modules. So, and that's really key to, to you know, building a really flexible, robust pipeline. And it also kind of makes things a lot simpler in a lot of respects. So if someone were to want to start creating their own variation on the AO node, they'd have access to all the technical tools here to be able to do that if they wanted to create their own tools. Oh, I just closed my, oh, there we go. So some of the key takeaways here are that we're, we're using a few things to generate the AO. We've got the height, the normal, and also the cavity is a really key component to that. And there's two modes here. If I switch it to the more expensive, it, it's doing multiple blur passes here. Uh, and then I'll bring in a little bit of the cavity. And then I can, you can start to see how you know, I've got you know, a bit more modeling in the ambient occlusion. We tend to stylize it a bit and really bring it over the top. And then set it to like an appropriate depth for how deep this surface is, right? And then if I want to go in and sculpt it a little bit more, then I can actually just come in and bring in just a little bit of my normal map influence. And you see it, it just kind of makes those forms a bit punchier. So this guy is a good example of how uh, you, know, you can find a lot of your own solution. You can come up with a lot of your own solutions inside Designer. So once we have all of these maps, right? I mentioned the importance of the, the hard-edged cavity and also the soft curvature. Once I have all those, 
I group them all together into just a surface info group. And this is so that I can access all of these channels really quickly with the material selection modes. And I'm going to use him, whoops, I'm going to use him up. So there's a few basic things going on. So if I duplicate this node, I'm going to reset him to defaults here. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a grayscale soup, right? Because what I plan on doing is using, using a gradient map in order to transform each of these grayscale pixels to a target color, okay? So, and actually I'll just demonstrate that here on this guy. So I'll duplicate him up. So when I'm initially working, you know, I might just say, well, I want to bring in some of my curvature, I want to bring in some of my AO, and then just a tiny bit of cavity, right? And now you can kind of see how I'm starting to get like a primary color pass here. And what we've also done, well, let's go there in the library. We've got a number of different presets as well. So if I was working on a wood texture, then I could actually just grab my, my wood color presets and I can just pick them from the library, right? And so all he is, is just a number of different presets, right? And this is all off color calibrated reference. It's carefully picked. And it's, it's also carefully set um, you know, with some expectations on what the input value range is. Uh, that way, everything is consistent. And then if I don't like how the color is coming out, well, then I can simply come in here and I can just change my, my curvature influence to be a little more, a little bit less. You know, I, I can really punch up my ambient occlusion, or I can even just change the fall off a bit. So if I just want a little bit of that dark brown in the cracks, I can do that, right? So it makes for like a super, super flexible workflow. And you're also kind of using, you know, library color reference, right? So again, I, I mentioned that all those albedo values are coming out of our, our color reference library. So once I have all of my primary colors established, right? So we've got this very sort of overall, you know, warm palette with a little bit of cool accent here. I'm ready to start blending it up. And what's interesting about this node here is, well, not much interesting. He's actually very, very basic, right? So he's not much different than the good old blend node. In fact, actually, I can just open him up. So you see, all I'm doing is I'm just taking all the different color inputs and I'm blending them together with some of my own special blend controls that I'll show you in a moment, and then just outputting them, right? But this allows me to basically, in one spot, really experiment with how these things are blending. So if I actually just go back and I just blend my first two layers, right, we can sort of see how this guy interacts. So I can start to basically say, well, I want more or less of the surface information, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, I mentioned throwing all of those surface maps, and by surface maps I mean the height, the AO, the cavity, and the curvature. I'm actually sending them all into this node right here, right? And then I've got a few controls built in that allow me to you know, blend these colors together. Because at Naughty Dog, this was the other important principle. It's always form first, right? That's why when I first started my texture, you know, I'm just in the sculpting and experimentation mode. Uh, and if the forms don't work, when I test them in game with a gray texture, then I'm gonna throw them out and move on. And the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that when you're blending a lot of your colors together, if that blend relationship is informed by your, your surface variation or your, your actual height and normal information, then you end up getting a much more natural integration of those colors. And for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to go with something a little more high contrast so you can really see the blend. So I've got a few basic controls where I can start to say, well, you know, how much of my height or my curvature start to influence that blend? 
I can also take some of my AO out and my, my cavity out as well. So you can see now how I've got this whole interesting new look here. And then in here, then I've just got a number of basic controls that are just local to this first blend right here. So I can actually randomize some noise through there just to kind of pick something kind of neat. And I've also got some basic controls where I can actually soften that blend so that they're a little bit better integrated. Or I can offset it so I've got a little more or less of one particular color. So this kind of workflow ended up being really, really flexible in that you know, any of these pieces and parts are interchangeable, right? So if I wanted to actually just you know, completely replace this guy with, with this guy, I can do that. And then I've just updated you know, my texture to something new and better. So by segmenting all these parts of my graphs like this, I'm able to really just continually modify these textures through the entire development process. So when, so when we talk about how we use, uh, let's start that over. So one of the things that, that makes our prop workflow unique is that you know, I'm showing you some of these tiling materials, right? And this rock example here may be added to the library, it may be local to a level, but you may then want to layer that rock material with something else. And that's mainly where our prop workflow comes in. And I'll show you a very simple example of that here. So one thing to note, and I've stripped this out, so this is a very, very basic example that just demonstrates the workflow. But you see there's a, there's a number of important factors even in the package organization here, right? So we do work with a number of different outsourcing studios and we really wanted to use designer in a unique way where our external partners could deliver us all of these props and objects but in a nice self-contained package, right? Because the idea is, you know, we want to be able to make changes to a lot of these props in-house but very, very quickly. And oftentimes you might know that if you have to go back and rebake an asset but you don't know what the bake settings were, it's very time consuming. So when a vendor delivered us this package, right away we could jump in there and review it. We've got access to the game mesh to load it up in the viewport. We can do a quick visual inspection. And we've also got access to this graph here, which is where all the bake maps are stored. So if I actually open him up, you'll see he's referenced inside of this assets graph. But if I open him up, he contains all the important bake data uh, that we'll need for that asset, from the normal and to the AO, and uh, the world position and cavity. And the only reason I've got him is in inside of a node is again for the, the convenience of workflow. Oh, we had a little hiccup there. There we go. So that if I wanted to grab all of the mesh data or all of the, uh, the base material maps for this model, I could just reuse him in various parts of my graph very, very quickly, right? So if we look at how we standardize our baking, and, and you know, ultimately we did that. We said we're, we're going to use Substance Designer as our main baker. And so any of the props and models that go through our pipeline, uh, they're going to be baked in Substance Designer and set up in this fashion. So here I've got my low poly model, right? Nope, not that one. <laughs> It's the exploded mesh. So here, you know, it, all the bake settings are saved. So if an artist had to receive this package and then maybe you know, fix a, a normal map orientation or maybe fix some ambient occlusion settings, we can make these tweaks really quickly, rebake, and then all of those updates propagate through the graph non-destructively. So that was really important because what could take an hour or more is now just a very, you know, very quick process, a few minutes to propagate simple fixes. And of course, all the high poly meshes are referenced in here as well. <laughs> 
any additional bitmap, any additional bitmaps that you might need. In this case, I've got some basic fingerprints on the metal here, are going to be referenced in here as well. So as we look at how the graph is organized, you know, at first it might seem like there's a lot going on, but there's really just a couple of very, very basic principles happening here, right? So I'm really just blending two materials together in my first node here. So I've got some type of metal. So I've got a, a few different metal colors coming together. So I've got a little bit of like a tungsten and some kind of brass. And then that's being combined with my, uh, my metal shader or my metal material. And then that's being blended with, I think in this case, just some kind of background material. But I mentioned the importance of uh, library data and reference material. There's a couple of cool things that we standardized as well. So you'll notice here that inside of my metal material, there's actually no color input, right? Because we wanted to drive everything off of a common library. So in this case, what I'm doing is, in order to get my metal material to work, I'm actually plugging in this, this color selector node. So now I can come in here and I can just choose what type of metal this is. So if I wanted to actually you know, turn this into a uh, you know, some sort of retro gold revolver or you know, pistol, then I could do that, right? So really, really fast change in one place. And then that process just kind of continues where I start to blend in my rough cast metal, some surface scratches, plastic, and then finally a little bit of grunge at the very end. And then that gives me, you know, my basic result. Over on the right hand side is where we're going to export all of our textures, right? And then down below, you'll notice we're also, for each material, exporting each mask. And this is so that once we get the asset into engine, if we need to override any of these layers, again, we have this data easily accessible. So if you were ready to export this asset into engine, then you could simply just say export outputs, and you'll see that all of the required outputs are right there, ready to go for you. So it's really easy integration. You could just set your desired texture type, your naming convention here, which you see is coming from our preferences, and then boom, straight to engine. Well, straight to, in our case, <laughs> server, and then our proprietary material blending software. But, but um, it made for that initial acceptance and integration, it made that process really, really fast. Um, I've got a few minutes left to show you some of the really cool things that help streamline this process. So one of the other important things when you're developing all these tools and pipelines, training was a very, very important part of it. And like I mentioned, you know, initially, you know, Substance being a very, you know, technically apparent program and, and, and a very procedural program, you know, it was very hard for some artists to grasp initially. Once we had the node library in place, you know, you know the adoption rate went up significantly because all those nodes were based on tools they were already used to using. Uh, and then another big win was how we handled training. Right, so you'll notice what I'm going through here is, is one of our early training examples where you know, I've got the same structure, so I've got my game mesh. And then in this case, this is a very, very simple node that represents, you know, a first review step, right? So if, if someone were to submit a high poly mesh and a sculpt for an artist review, then we can quickly come in here, visually inspect it, maybe change the, the surface response a little bit, look for some projection errors and, you know, bad bakes. Maybe take a look at the, the UV islands, how many you know, UV islands do we have? And then also a few other um, debug views here so that we can check UV orientation and such. So right away, we found that Substance Designer was a great place to come in, initially review the assets, and then if this phase passed, 
well then someone could move on to the to the material phase that I just showed you. So I'm going to skip straight ahead to uh, one of the really cool ones here. Actually, there's a cooler one. Let's do this guy. Yeah, this is my favorite. So we didn't just want to blend materials together, right? We wanted to blend them together in a natural way. Again, it's form first, right? And that's the biggest principle that goes through all of our workflow. The form has to be there. Ultimately, it's what's going to best represent lighting and material response. So you'll notice here I've got two very simple materials. You know, again, I've got just a very, very basic paint right here. And then I've got, you know, a rust. And they're being blended together right here. But before that process, I've got this fun node, where what he's doing is he's taking the paint and he's modifying it. So the paint normals you probably can't even see. They're very, very subtle. But here you can see how they've been modified by this, by this mask to get this type of natural response. And this whole effect is driven off of the height map, right? So if I actually wanted to go ahead and experiment again, because you know our pipeline is all about experimentation, right? Because oftentimes a lot of these most a lot of the most interesting things happen when you're experimenting. Things you never expected were possible, right? So I could, you know, come in here and I could, you know, get a completely unique look now just by swapping out the height map. And there's a few other basic controls, right? So I'm also feeding in all the mesh data, right? And that's also why, again, why I've organized them into nice groups. So it's easy to just pull them up and assign them to the correct group. So I've got my cavity and my world, my world normal here. So in this node, you'll see that there's a few different controls where I could actually just, where I can actually just enable or disable some of these masks. So if I disable my ambient occlusion, you'll see that this effect is now just localized to my cavities. Or if I actually just switch that, I can say, well, you know, in this case, my cavity effect is on both the peaks and the valleys. And I can go ahead and say, well, I just want this effect to, to appear in all those little concave crevices. So this, this kind of workflow actually made it like really, really flexible to not only blend materials together, but to find new and, and interesting ways of doing it. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah. So I thank you very much for, for being a part of this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I've got a little bit of time for some Q&A up here at the booth. Thank you.